So Joel, with Micah, we have another 8th century prophet. Um, unlike Hosea and Amos, whose activity was in uh, the northern kingdom, um, Micah prophesies concerning both Samaria and Jerusalem, so um, pertaining to both the north and the south. Um, his message, if you look at the beginning, it comes across as very, very similar to, especially what it reminds me of Amos, you know, the mountains will melt under him when the Lord appears. Um, um, the Lord uh, is coming out of this place and he will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. All this for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. Um, so what's distinctive about Micah in this context of the eighth century? Like, I think maybe not that much. Um, which is which, which is okay. Uh, I th I often read Micah as almost like it's like the paradigmatic eighth century material. Like it's just it's very general. Uh, it's got all of this, as you said, it's got all of the same stuff we're used to. I mean, even if you if you look at chapter two, right? Alas for those who devise wickedness and evil deeds on their beds, right? Ah, you're talking about the cows of Bashan Sounds again. Sounds like right? it could like, be an Amos, right? Um, so it's 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 this very. Um, it's very standard. It's very clearly social justice oriented, uh, and you know some of Micah's most famous language mm -hmm. is definitely uh, about that. I mean, one of the places where Micah, I think, does uh, something slightly interesting uh, is in chapter three, uh, where Micah seems to be mostly concerned uh, not with like uh, the not even with the not with the wealthy necessarily or with uh, sort of the mass of the people, but he's really going after Israel's like priestly and prophetic leaders. Um, and it, it's a good reminder, I think, that you know, the prophets do like to speak truth to power, uh, and power isn't always, you know, monarchy. Um, I mean, yes, heads of Jacob, rulers of the house of Israel uh, to begin with, but then, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray. Um, there's, you know, there's a, a sense of, uh, we, we, as we talked about sort of in the opening, right, there's a lot of prophets out there. Right. And, uh, you know, presumably if I'm prophesying one thing and you're prophesying another, well, one of us is lying. <laughs> um, and so seers shall be disgraced and diviners should be put to shame. Uh, but as for me, I am filled with power. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> there's, so there's this, there's this notion of, uh, you know, uh, th this competition, but also like that, that Israel as a nation is, is, is not, like it's not the common people who are at fault, right? It's the people who are tasked with leading them, whether that's, whether that's kings, rulers, the wealthy, who are all probably the same sort of social right. group, or prophets, who, and perhaps implicitly as we critique rulers and prophets simultaneously, you know, Micah might again be sort of like getting in a dig at these, like the, the pros whose job it is to prop up, um, prop up the wealthy and the powerful. Uh, eh, there's something about that that resonates with today, right. just, a, just a little bit. Um, uh, the, the other part of chapter three that I, I always find myself stopping on is, um, you know, right at the beginning, you heads of Jacob, rulers, uh, you who hate the good and love the evil, who tear the skin off my people and the flesh off their bones, who eat the flesh of my people, flay their skin off them, break their bones in pieces, chop them up like meat in the kettle and flesh, and, like... That is cannibalism. <laughs> it is indeed. Right? Uh, some people, I mean, some scholars read this and say, "Oh, it's like they're they're being sacrificed, right?" Like because this is sac ah, it doesn't read like sacrifice to me. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this is like it, it's it's almost you know the like the the, the modern phrase right, eat the rich. Mm -hmm. So this is like the this is like an accusation that the rich are literally eating, literally eating the poor. But it's it's unbelievably stark imagery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it speaks to the um, yeah the, the the power of the indictment of of the of Israel's leaders, right? That they're just you know they they purport to you know have the community's best interests at heart, right? As politicians, as leaders, always do, um, as, as 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 prophets sometimes do in this case, but but they are really simply economically benefiting from from their leadership role. So back to your point about prophetic authority, one of the really cool things about the prophets is when we see, like when, when later communities read the prophets, like we always know who's right, 
right? Like according to the text, we know who's really speaking for God. So when Micah um, lambasts his opponents or Jeremiah famously has all these conflicts with, with other prophets, like we know that, you know, God has really inspired Jeremiah and the other ones are false prophets and here too. But you can see a little bit how it would have looked like in the moment. And when we, you know, when, when we today or any other period, we encounter these charismatic individuals who claim to speak for God, and Micah's like, no, 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 I'm not, you know, I'm not among all these institutions, but, you know, I am filled with power, with the spirit of the Lord. Like, how is that claim supposed to be received by communities in the moment, right? And so, like, you know, in a way, it's, it's only with the, with the hindsight of, of tradition that these prophets sort of become legitimated. Yeah. But, but it, it, it also shows us this sort of social component of prophecy, right? Yeah. Also, I mean, as you suggest, right, some prophets obviously, I mean, most, the vast majority have been lost to us. Um, even, even just their names, you know, I don't know how much, I don't know whether like there was a prophet named Micah who actually said these things or whether there was a prophet named Micah who was famous and God's name got attached. What I know is uh, there are lots of prophets who are lost to us, but Micah is a great, is a funny case because of course Micah is cited by Jeremiah by name. Indeed. Right, which... And were there nothing else, uh, if we didn't have the book, we'd be like, oh, I guess there must have been a cool prophet named Micah. Mm -hmm. We have a book named Micah. I don't know, uh, it, but, you know, and I don't know whether the Micah that Jeremiah is citing is the same. The, 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 the gap between, like, the real world, I mean, you were talking mm -hmm, about, like, mm -hmm. you know, back then what it must have looked like. It's very hard to access because there's such a gap between, like, what would an ancient prophet have actually been doing? Mm -hmm. Writing? I don't think so. Right. Somebody's transcribing? Maybe. Um, in any case, so what you got with Micah, and this is, I think, one of the ways that this book is, is really fascinating to read as, this, as, as a record of sort of, uh, you know, a prophetic text that is used, as said, by Jeremiah. But also, you know, you've got, as we said, sort of the standard 8th century stuff going on, social justice, uh, and you know exactly where you are. And then you get to chapter four and like something weird happens. First of all, suddenly I'm reading Isaiah. <laughs> Indeed. Right? Like the beginning of, uh, of chapter four of Micah is, you know, in days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and raised upon the hills. People shall stream to it and many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and the house of the God of Jacob. That he may teach us his way. Like this is, it's. I mean, it's literally the it's same. It's literally as word for too. word. Uh, yes. And uh, you know, and they, they shall beat their swords into plowshares. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is like Isaiah's most famous material, really. Like Some it's, of it. It's Isaiah. <laughs> Isaiah bit. has a lot of famous material. Right, but it, it was like this is this is Isaiah's bit mm -hmm. uh, that Micah seems to be seems to be stealing. Uh, you know, all the way into like this this vision of in that day I will assemble, the, I will assemble, I will gather from all around. Uh, and then you go, wait, that's weird, right? Uh, why do they need to be assembled? Why do they need to Where be assembled? Where, <laughs> what happened? Why do they need to be assembled? Uh, and suddenly you realize it's suddenly talking as if the exile has happened. There's allusions here to like, your the, the, your former monarchy, right? Like mm -hmm. back when you had a king, it was like, well, that that's not eighth century, uh, and so what we what we get in Micah is a text that I think really openly has been expanded in uh, the exilic or post exilic mm -hmm. period for sure eighth century. I mean, we get the dating formula at the beginning that tells us exactly when Micah prophesies. We got all the language that's all very eighth century social justice, everything mm -hmm. you'd expect. And then you get this restoration language that has to be exilic or, or mm -hmm. post-exilic. Um, I mean, what do we, what, what do you say about it? I mean, yeah, I think it's really, I think it's really helps us to, to understand how we should be reading these texts in a sense. As, so we, we talked, you know, when we talked about the Book of the Twelve as a whole, we talked about it as, a, as a, a collection that contains earlier material and late material that sort of came together over time. And what can be said of the collection as a whole can be said of the individual texts as well. And so, you know, one of the things that you can say about, about most biblical texts, right, is that this idea of, 
like one author that wrote the thing down and then it's done. Like if I wrote a book, you know, if I wrote a novel and I wrote it and I published it, or if I wrote, yes, yes, please, please no. Why did you become a novel? You have books. You don't need to pretend you're a novelist. <laughs> but, but novels are more interesting, right? <laughs> um, but point being, right, that um, you mentioned the figure of Micah. You said, well, I don't like maybe this wasn't even a real person. Or maybe there was a guy named Micah who was known, you know, and then some other poet wrote these beautiful oracles and said, you know, nobody knows who I am, but everybody knows who Micah is, so I'm just going to kind of say that Micah wrote these oracles, right? That might be going on, so it's some disruption there of the idea of the author and the, um, you know, the name on the text and who's actually responsible for the words, but also the idea that these figures could be, you know, sites for you know the, the expansion where other things could be attached to the tradition and and the tradition itself gets reformulated so that just as Micah pro, you know prophesized disaster in earlier periods and these these prophets who call Israel to account were probably then read in the in the light of the disasters that did ensue sure. right both of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom as you know, this legitimated their, their prophecy, that also they would have seen a, a better future to come, would have addressed this new situation of, of gosh, now, now we have been punished, what do we do next? So the, the, the idea that these texts are kind of, you know, rolling corpus is a famous term that was used for Jeremiah, but that, that they were expanded and, and, and reconfigured to address new situations. And that could all be attributed to one eighth century prophet is, is like it really makes a difference, right, in how we, how we understand what these texts are as yeah. texts. Yeah, this is, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good example. I, I, I often say something like, with the, maybe the exception of Obadiah, there's not a single book of the Bible that has not, that hasn't been touched up. Less, more, a little here or there. For all I know, Obadiah has too. I've been like, who reads it? Um, uh, we're not going to talk about it in, in uh, the, the one chapter of Obadiah. This is its moment. Uh, but Micah is, uh, yeah, as you say, Micah is like a, a wonderful, uh, a wonderful, right, really on its face. It's like somebody in later times thought that's still good stuff. And I, and, and, I need, and I needed to, to, to speak to now. Uh, and, you know, is, does it fall into the category of, like, pseudepigraphy? Is somebody pretending to be Micah? Or are they all pretending to be Micah? You know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah, that's a big question to, for, for, our, last, for our last 30 seconds. But, but this idea that authorship is, is not, you know, it's, it's a different way of thinking about the names on texts than, than comes to be in, in, in the modern period, for sure. Yeah. 